So the, um, I want to thank you for hosting this event today. The, you know, the, this, there's a lot of work going on. As many of you know, uh, we've been doing a lot of work in sort of balancing renewables and um, all the different, and uh, hydrocarbons and all the different elements of the energy industry. And so I sort of want to give you an overview of that today. Um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of energy-related knowledge in this room. You know, I've talked to people this morning who are involved in the tidal energy, involved in oil and gas, involved in electricity, and they all work together and there's synergies with all of those. As many of you know, I've been involved in this for years. Um, in the introduction, they mentioned it and talked about the fact that when, when I was on council, I chaired the Energy and Underground Services Committee and we looked at ways uh, to maximize the opportunities in the energy field. And I'm very excited about the opportunities of the sector and very excited about engaging all Nova Scotians of all backgrounds in, in real dialogue, in, in discussions about the issues, in constructive dialogue. And I know that many of you have witnessed some of the things that have changed over the years, and we've been moving from a, a transformation from uh, almost a 100% coal, something like 95% coal in this province on the electricity side, to much cleaner sources, and using competitive energy sources closer to home. And we're trying to set winning conditions for all different elements of the industry. And many of you know that on Friday, I, or a few weeks ago, I was able to announce a partnership with the United Kingdom on tidal energy, which will be really one of our very exciting opportunities in the future. And on Friday, we announced the last, uh, we announced the two remaining berth holders for force out in Parsboro, Open Hydro and Black Rock Tidal. But in addition to filling those berths, we realized that we needed to create a condition where we actually were there, that we were, the province was involved. And so we announced a contribution of $4.2 million to ensure that clean, renewable and predictable tidal energy will actually be able to connect to homes and businesses in this province. And that was really important because there's no point in doing these advancements in this work if you can't connect to the grid. So, you know, and then this fall we will welcome the world leaders in offshore renewable energy uh, when we share, uh, when we host the International Conference on Ocean Energy in November. It'll be the first time that conference is ever held outside of Europe. Uh, it is the world's leading conference on offshore renewable energy. And on land, we're encouraging the development of community-based wind projects, community biomass projects, and other community energy options. And recently, as many of you know, I updated the rules around that. And of course, we're also continuing our approach to research on the oil and gas potential. Because the reality is, is that as we move away from um, fossil fuels in terms of electricity generation and so forth, we are still decades, at least decades, off before you have a world where you don't have fossil fuels. And when I was speaking at Dow the other day and we talked about the fact that you only need to go to the local playground and realize that the entire plastic playground is made out of oil, or the asphalt bitumen that paves the roads, or you, know, you take the Metro Transit bus and you, you, even if you have a hybrid, you have the gas backup and so forth. So the idea with in fossil fuels and you know it's, it was interesting that when I was in Houston and Calgary and I talked to BP and Shell and companies like that they agreed with this it's, it's about maximize how do you make those last longer by investing in others so that's why a balance is very important um, you know there's there's a lot going on in and it's more it's about more than just royalties a lot of people focus on the royalties from the offshore when we talk about oil and gas but it's it's not that's important, right? If you talk to Diana Whalen, that's probably the only thing she cares about. How much money are you going to get me from the... Uh, but, but it's not about that. It's about the opportunities. It's about the fact that we have the opportunity for an ocean technology sector here that rivals the world. And the same ships that are used in the oil and gas industry are the same ships that are used in the tidal industry, are the same ships that are used in offshore wind. It's the same technology, it's the same expertise, and so you build a, an environment of expertise. Now, oil and gas on a pure money basis is absolutely the single biggest opportunity in the future economic growth of our province at the moment. And, you know, we're proceeding with cautious optimism, uh, but there exists lots of potential, such as fertilizer production, LNG, research and development, 
And as many of you know, I've been putting considerable effort in, along with many of our staff, to talk to companies and see what are the benefits, what are the opportunities for this province. And I just want to show you, many of you saw the title video the other day, so I'm not going to show you the title video. If you haven't seen it, you can go online. Um, so instead of showing you two videos, I am going to show you one that uh, we've put together for the offshore oil and gas shows, um, which will give my voice a break for a second. So that, um, Sandy and the team recently had that in Kuala Lumpur for OTC Asia and uh, a version of that or something similar that will be at OTC in Houston as well. And it's about telling people, there's a lot of people that look at Nova Scotia around the world and say, geez, we didn't know you had that. We didn't know you had that expertise. We, and, and it means something. And the play fairway analysis, which many of you are familiar with and was mentioned there, uh, was a $15 million investment. It was a smart investment in a geoscience atlas of Nova Scotia's offshore. And when we show that to people, they go, wow, I didn't know you had that potential. And so we're committed to continuing that research because that research benefits a lot of different sectors. And it, obviously it benefits the oil and gas industry, but it benefits a lot of people working in the offshore. And it's our intent to expand this data and enhance its usability. You know, we've, as you saw in the video, we've estimated there's about 120 cubic, a trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 8 billion barrels of oil in the offshore. But our understanding of the geology is part of what makes it possible to find the resources because for those of you who are in the oil and gas business, you know that uh, just because the oil is there doesn't mean it's recoverable. Just because the gas is there doesn't mean it's recoverable. It doesn't mean it's safely recoverable. And so it's a matter of finding uh, resources that are economically, environmentally, and, and socially responsible to, to, uh, to extract. But so the science works, and it makes sense to do this all based on science, and it's paid off. Uh, Shell, as you know, has committed a billion dollars in exploration over the next six years. Uh, they completed their seismic work last year, and they're now preparing to drill probably around seven wells next year in, in the offshore. And BP has invested a billion dollars in exploration in a two-year seismic ac acquisition program that will start uh, this month, actually. And these represent the largest bids in Atlantic Canadian history. And that's significant because that's the kind of interest that's being shown. And when you go down uh, and meet with many of these companies, they're now talking about the Laurentian Subbasin and some of these other opportunities that are there. Um, you know, and both of these companies have talked about the importance of the play fairway analysis in their, uh, in their decision making. And so, as we look forward to the, the new call for bids, which will be coming up shortly, you can see sort of, we're trying to match our research with the work that's already being done. And you can see where BP and Shell is, you can see what's coming out in 2014 and 2015. And, and this is the kind of stuff that we're trying to match our work with where the industry is going to be. So they can look at the data, they can know what the data is going to be. They can say, they can make their own 
decisions based on what's available and what's there. And so we are committed in the throne speech, we committed to continuing the investment in the research and we will do that. Uh, we will continue to ensure that uh, the science is there, that the information is available and that it's readily available to all those who, who are interested in bidding. And when we, we look around the world, there are more than just the usual players now involved in this sort of thing. And, and quite frankly, I mean, things change on a daily basis in this, this industry because if you had thought a month ago that Russia was going to annex Crimea, um, you know, you would have been crazy. But now they have, and that's actually changed the energy marketplace in Nova Scotia all of a sudden because projects like the LNG terminal, all that suddenly have different economics around them because people are looking at the security uh, situation. You know, we have invested another million dollars in brand new geoscience work for the Laurentian Subbasin, which was the one shown up there in 2014. And we've, contact, uh, we've contracted uh, BSEP Fran Lab for this research. And they're the same, work who, same people who did the original play fairway analysis. And again, we'll provide this data free of charge. This isn't, you know, whoever wants to see it, they can see it. And you saw Kim, uh, Kim Doan there looking at our play fairway analysis book in the video, and, and it really is that big. And if you want to, we can give it to you on CD, it's a lot easier to carry, but it's, it, you can come and look at it. It's amazing to go through it and actually look at it in the office. Um, and we're already seeing excitement on this sort of stuff. It, we're, when we talk to people, like, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in that. And people are talking about partnerships that they could put together. Um, when, when, you know, when we were down in Houston, people were saying, well, you know, maybe this partnership would work or that partnership would work. So much like the tidal industry where we saw a whole bunch of companies coming together, we're seeing the same sort of thing. In the near future, we hope to put together a multi-year program of government-funded geoscience and marketing to put in place. And some of that has begun. Uh, I mean, you see the videos, you see, see what we're doing. Now, the offshore is a long play. They find oil next year, it will not be in production in 2016. And I can't tell you how many people ask me that. Um, it's, you got to build the rigs, you got to figure out the environmental side, you got to make sure that you have all the safety measures in place. There's a lot more involved in that. So this is, this is a long-term uh, game. This isn't... I will tell you right now with some certainty that the odds of there being a production well in Nova Scotia by the time this term of government is up is probably not very high. Um, but we need to understand that we're investing in the future. Uh, and we're investing in the future and we need to do it smart and there's a lot of excitement. When I travel around the province, people are very excited about this. And this is a very high priority. Uh, for our government and I intend with the support of the government and the staff and energy to continue to build on this interest that we've seen. Um, never know which button's going to do what. So as you know at the moment, um, Deep Panook and Sable are combining to produce roughly 500 cubic uh, feet of natural gas a day. And, and that's good for the local market. Um, I mean, I think you've all seen these kind of maps before. You know where the gas is coming in. There are also some, some significant discovery licenses out there. Um, you know, and it's just a matter of making the economics work. If, if somebody can figure out a way to make those economics work, then they will tap into that gas. And there are opportunities outside the low price of, or uh, I won't say that Bob Hamp is here. He'll hate it for say natural gas is low. But it's low here compared to Europe. The, it, if you look at the price of gas, at the moment, the economics don't work for drilling in offshore for the most part, unless you find some astronomical amount. But what it does work is if you're doing LNG plants or fertilizer plants or you're looking at other markets or you're looking at addressing the security situation in Russia. So in terms of Shell, uh, they are reviewing 10,000 square kilometers of data they collected. It was actually the first 3D wide azimuth subsurface mapping ever conducted in offshore Canada. Uh, and I had the chance to go down. They have this room that, have you ever seen the Matrix where they put on the glasses and you walk and it's 3D? It's kind of like that. Um, and it was really neat. You know, you walked in, you could see the geology. Uh, I didn't understand it all, but the, science, the geologists there are just jumping up and down and they're so excited. And so the quality of that data is very, very good. And, and really it comes down to them picking what are the right targets. Uh, Shell, so as I said, Shell has plans to deliver as many as seven wells on their exploration licenses and they've spoken publicly now about the, their plan to be in there in 2015. 
Now, BP is going to be conducting a three-dimensional seismic survey in water from 100 to 3,000 meters deep, and they're going to cover 14,000 square kilometers. And I know you had a briefing from them at a breakfast a little while ago, so I won't go into too much detail on theirs. But Western GECO will be here, and I think most Nova Scotians are around will get a chance to see the ships when they come into the harbor uh, at the end of this, we think at the end of this month. So th the opportunities are not limited to the offshore, though. And that's what we, we all seem to always think about the offshore, and, and people don't realize some of the stuff that's happened in onshore. The first onshore well in Nova Scotia was drilled in 1869. There have been 139 wells drilled in Nova Scotia since then. And when you talk to people, they don't seem to realize that. But similar to our offshore process, we've begun the process of building an onshore atlas to map out where oil and gas potential is. And this is new geoscience information, and we will do the exact same thing. We will provide that information to industry uh, and to the public. So, you know, this gives you an idea of where some of those uh, licenses are and so forth. And, you know, just last fall, East Coast Energy drilled two exploratory coal bed methane wells in Stellagen. And what was interesting about that is it happened in the same week that all the protests were happening in New Brunswick uh, on fracking and so forth. And of course, this wasn't involving fracking. And I was down in Stellarton, and the response from the community was overwhelmingly positive about this project. They were excited about it. They were interested about it. And a lot of that has to do with how that company was engaging the community and making sure that everybody knew what was going on. The neighbors had, had the tests of their wells in their hands in advance, all of that sort of thing. So people felt involved. You know, they were focused on safety and environmental measures, and now they're looking at what the results are to determine the potential. And that could result, that could turn what has been a sad story regarding methane in the Stellarton area into a positive story for that community in all of Nova Scotia. Now, the questions always come up about fracking. Doesn't matter whether you're going to frack the well or not, they still ask, right? And that's why we. Uh, are conducting a totally independent review of fracking. Um, the first thing I said to Dr. David Wheeler when I met him was, I said, I'm not going to tell you what I think about it, and I haven't told anybody what I think about it, um, because I don't want to taint the process. I don't want to, you know, I have my own opinions, like every, probably every Nova Scotian, but we committed to allowing them to do their own process, be involved, um, go, uh, do studies, and the, po and the feedback thus far has been very positive. You know, there were, there were some concerns at first from people who didn't necessarily understand what the process would be, but now people understand that, okay, there's studies coming out, I get to read them, I get to comment on them. And, you know, by this summer, we should have that review back, people will get to comment, and we'll make a decision on where we go with that, and we'll, we'll figure that out. But we're doing this in a way that is smart and is based on science. And it's based on the Nova Scotia context, because what works in Oklahoma doesn't necessarily work in Nova Scotia. What works in Alberta doesn't necessarily work here, because if you talk, I, I've had so many geologists tell me that uh, Nova Scotia has a fractured geology. And that's the thing, we need to know what, what, is, what is it about Nova Scotia? What, what, would, what works in Nova Scotia? And so this, is, this report is about Nova Scotia and the decisions will be for Nova Scotians. Um, I talked about LNG possibilities briefly, <coughs> and I think there's some folks here from Guysboro actually, today, and you know, the LNG opportunities are part of our plan to maximize the existing and developing assets in our onshore and offshore. Recently, and, and so there's a, a number of parts to this, uh, there's, there's a number of parts to the whole natural gas story. On the first side, it's access. How do you get enough gas here? Our price is higher here than it is in Boston, and that's a problem. It's a problem whether you're heating your home, it's a problem whether you are uh, trying to make fertilizer, it's a problem for all kinds of reasons. So uh, recently we met with Spectra Energy, and shortly after they announced the Atlantic Bridge project, which would bring more gas into Nova Scotia and would basically level the price between Boston and, New England, or Boston and Halifax for the most part. And this combined with the recently approved Alton Gas Storage Project <coughs> would put us economically on a more level playing field and would open the doors to other things like petrochemical industries and so forth. So then we take our existing infrastructure in the Maritimes and Northeast Pipeline from Goldboro. 
which would allow us to market our gas, you know, when it's, when it's economic, and go back the other way and market it into New England, or bring Western Canadian gas or U.S. gas into our market. And it just, it, it puts us in the middle of, of a, a loop that flows both ways. And so that expansion by Spectra, if they're, if they're able to fill that open season, would allow options in both directions. Our natural gas projects in the offshore especially are really being driven, and, and the LNG projects are actually being driven by needs in Asia and Europe for the most part. Um, there is a glut of gas in the Marcella Shale and I think we all understand that. But the question becomes, uh, how do you serve uh, countries like England and Germany and, and Korea and so forth? And so, uh, some of you know that Pyridae Energy plans to develop and op operate an LNG uh, plant in Goldboro. Uh, which includes a tanker terminal and marine facilities, and they recently received their environmental assessment. It's 5 million metric tons uh, to start, but the approval is for 10. It's scalable. Um, apparently, they can stack these things, so it's almost infinitely scalable at a certain point. And those are the kind of projects that can make a lot of sense, uh, and they're working on the economics at the moment. As well, uh, H Energy from India has plans to build an LNG plant and export terminal not far from there. Uh, they're not quite as far along, but over at Melford Point. And across the Strait of Kanzo, there's an existing oil transshipment facility. I think many of you would be aware of New Star's oil terminal, which can move 1.7 million barrels of oil a day. Um, and, and their markets change too. You know, think, things have changed. So they're looking at what the opportunities are, and they've been looking at bringing in Western Canadian crew by rail or an expansion of pipelines or, or whatever the case may be to take advantage of bringing it to Tidewater. So the other side of the energy is renewable energy. And these are exciting times to be involved in the renewable energy business. Um, we are transforming how we generate electricity in this province. And, and some of that's because we have to. You know, I, I said at Dow the other day, somebody said to me, they said, well, geez, isn't it great that there's governments that sit around and create renewable targets? And I said, you know what? It's great to give me credit or the NDP or the Tories credit, you know, whichever you want for, like, creating renewable targets. The reality is it isn't as altruistic as you think it is. There are world treaties. There are world realities that mean that the coal price is going through the roof. There is stability in renewable targets. There are greenhouse gas emission targets by federal governments. Those all have to be addressed. And it doesn't matter who it is, somebody was going to have to address that issue of needing price stability and diversity. Uh, we had something like 95% of our energy just a few years ago was by coal. Well, it doesn't matter what you do if, if, you know, many of you own businesses and if all, your product, all of your revenue comes from one product or all your expenses come from one product, you get hit really bad. So you need to diversify and it's about creating a portfolio. So, you know, we have a target, most of you will know this target, it's 25% of electricity uh, from renewable sources by 2015. Uh, we will meet or beat that target, right Bob? Uh, the, uh, and 40% by 2020. Um, you know, and the federal government has legal requirements that drive this too. You know, they announced regulations on coal burning electricity that have significant implications. And so under the equivalency agreement uh, that was signed by the previous government, we're able to actually manage that in a way that is much more cost effective for Nova Scotians. The, and by doing that, we will save over a billion dollars a year to ratepayers, and so that's significant. So we are doing this in a Nova Scotia way. Well, listen, I was in opposition at the time, and it was something I said was a good idea that the government did. I said, listen, that makes a lot of sense. You are creating a new way to do it, so you phase out the coal plants on a more orderly fashion, other than just walking in and th uh, throwing out the keys. Um, we have, so we've gone from 90% in 2007 coal to something like 57% in 2012. And now most of those renewables actually come from our backyard, uh, you know, wind, uh, tides to a small extent, uh, some hydro, uh, there's a lot of wind. Um, the, uh, not only in the legislature. The, um, and in the next few years we'll be connected to the um, Newfoundland and Labrador's uh, hydroelectricity project. And I think, you know, I got asked this morning on the radio, about, well, you know, are you happy with the Maritime Link project? And, and listen, it's no secret that I had concerns with the original arrangement that was there, but I think 
all of the concerns that I had, we managed to deal with and we managed to get changes to the agreement. I will tell you though, when I go to Newfoundland sometimes now, I am not a, a, a well-liked person on the open line shows. Um, so part of me thinks that means we probably got a pretty good deal for Nova Scotia. The, you know, but that's, so 35 years, we have a guarantee on how the price is managed on the, on the surplus energy now. It means that we, it's predictable, but we also don't have to buy it if there's another cheaper option. Um, we talked, I, I met with, um, the Premier and I met with Siemens the other day about uh, the tidal stuff, and, and they, their projection is that by 2030, they can actually bring tidal energy down to a competitive price to most of the other energy sources we have today. And they showed how they're able to do that. That's you know, that's what is 20, it's almost 25th, that's 15 years from now. That's not bad um, that they could bring that price down. They also figured there will be 5,000 direct jobs associated with it in this province by that point. I mean, that's huge. Um, you know, we are, and then there's the ComFit program, and, and we're committed to continuing that. One of the challenges we had with it, and you'll know that I made some changes to the ComFit program recently, and one of the challenges was there's a lot of approved projects and not very many of them have been built yet. And so we needed to s step back and say, okay, let's figure out which of these are actually gonna happen. Um, because it's hard, listen, it's tough to raise financing. Um, they need the approval, then they go for the financing, then they need the, uh, the approval from the municipalities. So we're working with them to try and, and see what happens and then we'll adjust that program as we go. The other thing we needed to do is we introduced legislation that allows competition in the renewable energy market and to sell directly to customers. And we needed to know there are certain elements that may have been in the ComFit program before that may be able to use that, that option. Um, the, you know, we, the, we've been, um, the energy field is very broad. Um, you know, I, it's funny, I get asked all the time, geez, all your time must be taken up with electricity. Uh, and, and you can probably understand why that is, because people call me all the time and write me all the time um, for all the things that you read in the newspaper. But that isn't our sole focus. And, and I hope that over what, what I've, I've said today, and I know we've had sort of a bit of a different morning than we planned, but I, I, I hope that you can see, like, we're focused on a lot of different things. So we have the renewable energy side that we are trying to push very, very, very hard. We're trying to deal with the uh, with rates. I mean, Nova Scotia Power is a private company, um, so we don't, you know, we don't walk into the legislature and set the rates for Nova Scotia Power. But what we do do is try and create the conditions and the opportunities that don't put pressure on rates unnecessarily, or that we can mitigate. Uh, rates or that we can find ways to ensure that we become competitive against other jurisdictions. On the oil and gas side, we have a group that is working very hard and I mean, Sandy and Kim and those guys, they have more air miles in the run of a year because they are running around, this, around the world telling people about this province and the opportunities that exist here and they're working very, very hard on that and making sure that people know that there are opportunities here and how to take advantage of them. And then we have a sustainable transportation side as well. And my role in all this, and what I've been trying to do when I go on some of these, is to sit there and go, okay, you're coming in. Let's talk about how we can maximize the benefits for Nova Scotia companies. How do we make sure that they know you're there and what the opportunities are? How do we make sure that if you're going to spend a billion dollars in, uh, on an offshore program, that we, we know we're not getting the whole billion dollars, and anybody that tells you that is just out to lunch, but that we're going to, get, we're going to work and make sure that we get as much as we possibly can, and that we plan for success, because that's the other thing we're trying to do. We are trying to plan for success in oil and gas, in tidal, in renewable energy, and we are trying to find ways to maximize the opportunities to see investment here in this province. So uh, I've been all over the place a little bit because I changed the order of things. That's what I do. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate the time this morning, and I know we're running probably a bit over the time we anticipated, but if anybody had any questions...